Do you know that there is only one God in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you know that Jesus said he is the only way to heaven, and his death and resurrection bring forgiveness of sins to all who believe? Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study God's Word, the Bible, together. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. Today we talk about the first parable in the Gospel of Mark. Do you know what the word parable means? The New Testament was written in Greek, and the Greek word parabole is parable. Para means alongside, bole means to put. So a parable is a put alongside. Jesus would tell a story to the crowd and they didn't understand it. So privately to the disciples, Jesus parabole laid out the real meaning of the story to the disciples. A lot of people think Jesus told parables to make things clear and easy to understand. We're going to learn here, it's just the opposite. Jesus told parables so unbelievers couldn't understand them, and that's what it says. I mean, we're going to look at one of the most difficult verses in the Bible today uh, from Mark chapter 4, and one commentator said this, We should not try to soften the hard verses of the Bible, but just let them speak to us. So let's do that. Would you take out a Bible? Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. And this is kind of heavy duty, so let's pray. <laughs> God the Father, as we open the word, we ask you to open our ears, our hearts, open my mouth. And Lord, speak to us about four kinds of people that there are in this world. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower or the four soils, four kinds of people. Let me quickly tell it and then we'll go through it slowly. Jesus said there's a farmer who's got a bunch of seed. And he's taking the seed and he's throwing it out all over the place uh, to raise his crops. Some of the seed falls on the road and the birds come and gobble up the seed. And Jesus said, those are the people that hear the word of God, but the devil comes, gobbles it up so they can't believe it. Some of the seed falls on the rocky soil and it grows up a little bit, but because it doesn't have root, it dies immediately when the sun comes out. And Jesus said, those are people who don't have roots in their faith, and they believe for a while, but when persecution comes, they fall away. Other, the third group of seed falls on the thorny soil. It grows up a little bit, but then the thorns choke it out, so it dies. And Jesus said, these are people who believe for a while, but then the thorn of worry or pleasure or money crowds out the, the seed and it dies. But the fourth people, that seed lands on the good soil and it grows 30, 50, 100 fold, big, huge crop. These are Christians who are living their faith. That's the parable. Let's get into the details. Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 1. And Jesus began to teach again by the seashore, and such a very great multitude gathered before him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And all the multitude were by the seashore on the land. And Jesus was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching. The first lesson I want you to get is this. Tell stories. Jesus told stories. And... If I think of the two best preachers I've ever heard in my life, one was old Dr. Bob Smith at Bethel College, and the other was Elmer Murdoch in Omaha, Nebraska. Both of them are dead, and I can't remember their abstract truths that they taught, but I can still tell their stories. I, in fact, you've heard some of their stories because that's what people remember. So mom and dad, tell your kids Bible stories. Grandma and Grandpa, buy your kids a Bible storybook. I've showed this before, but I, I was at a garage sale. And here, I think for about 50 cents, somebody is selling Ingemeyer's Bible storybook. When I was a little boy, this is the book mom read to us from. I loved this book because it had such colorful pictures. So for 50 cents, I had to buy Ingemeyer's Bible storybook. So Mom and dad, tell stories, get a Bible story book, read them to your kids. 
That's the first thing we learned today. Look at verse 3. Here's the story. Listen to this, said Jesus. Behold, the sower went out to sow. And it came about that as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. And other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And another seed fell on the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. And other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up, they increased. They were yielding a crop and were producing 30, 60, and 100-fold. Jesus was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And now for one of the most difficult verses of the Bible, Mark chapter 4, verse 10. As soon as Jesus was alone, his followers with the twelve began asking him about the parable. And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables in order that while seeing, they may not see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may not hear and understand, lest they return and be forgiven. So here's the difficult teaching. Parables are told to hide things from people. Why did Jesus tell the parables? so outsiders couldn't believe and repent. That's what it says. <laughs> now, um, I know that's difficult because elsewhere in the Bible, it says God is not willing that anyone should repent. Second Peter chapter 3, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why does God sometimes hide things from unbelievers so they can't believe? Well, I'm going to give you my best shot. Here we go. There comes a point when a sinner has so repeatedly rejected God that God finally says, okay, you don't want me, you don't get me, and their heart gets hard. Tonight in Minneapolis, at an elementary school in Minneapolis, the Minneapolis Public Schools is putting on a drag queen story time for children. At the same event for the adults, a man, a woman who looks like a man from Children's Hospital, Minnesota is coming to talk to their parents about their gender affirming care program where they give hormone blockers to children to prevent them from developing naturally. Isn't this from hell? And this is called rejecting God and getting a hard heart. Now, I think we're all born with a hard heart. We're all born sinners, and until God softens your heart, you won't come to him. I get this from 2 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul writes to the young preacher Timothy, Timothy, correct your opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. So notice there, God is the one that grants you the ability to repent. And you might say, well, that sounds like predestination. And you're right. Predestination is in the Bible, so we're obligated to believe it. So, and, and somebody says, well, why does God choose to save one sinner and soften his heart and pass over the others? I don't know. This is called the mysteries of God, but it's in the book. Look at verse 13. And Jesus said to them, Do you not understand this parable? And how will you understand all the parables? Now he's going to explain it. The sower sows the word. The seed in, in this parable is the word of God. So here's the, the for, next lesson. Our duty is to sow the word. Christian, the reason you're on earth is to sow the word. So are you doing that? by the way you live your life, by the way you spend your free time, by the way you spend your money, are you sowing the word of God? You know, I uh, had somebody on my staff many years ago by the name of Jeremy, and he loved to evangelize. And he would go into our neighborhood and doorbell after doorbell talk to anybody who would listen about Jesus. And then he would go to 
to the big mall of America here in Minnesota and stop shoppers and talk to them about Jesus. He was sowing the word. Now, uh, probably God's not going to ask you to do that, but he is going to ask you in some way to sow the word of God the way uh, with the people God has given you in life. I like to buy a bunch of salvation tracts and leave them maybe when I'm leaving a tip or when I'm talking to somebody, just, but somehow, some way, sow the word. Verse 12, excuse me, 15. And these are the ones who are on this, beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes, that's the birds, and takes away the word which has been sown in them. Here's the first person. There's four kinds of people now in the world. Person number one. This is the seed on the road that gets gobbled up. Person number one hears but does not believe. I remember a friend of mine, her mother went to the Episcopal Church, but her mother didn't believe any of it. And so one day my, my friend said to her mom, Mom, why do you go to church if you don't believe any of it? And she said, well, I know the Christmas story is a myth and the Easter story is a myth, but they're such beautiful myths. <laughs> so here's a woman who went to church and heard the word, but nope. I went to a United Methodist Church once during Christmas time. The preacher got in the pulpit and said, today I preach on the myth of the virgin birth. You know, you can hear the word of God. You can even preach the word of God and the devil gobbles it up so you don't believe it. Let me give you another example. So I was on the plane sitting next to an older lady from Germany. And she tells me, in Germany, we go to church till we're about 12 and get confirmed. And then we don't go to church again until we're old. But then she said, uh, when I had my daughter and when she was a little girl, she wanted to go to Sunday school. So I started taking her to church and now I'm part of a church community and I'm happy to, to be part of a church community. I said, well, that's great. And, but I thought I should share the gospel with her. So I said, it's important that we know we're sinners, that we, we know we deserve hell, but God loves us so much. God sent Jesus to die on the cross to save us from hell and believe in him, you'll be forgiven and saved. And she said, I don't believe that. My loving Jesus would never send anyone to hell. I said, I, th I think if you count the verses, Jesus talks more about hell than he does about heaven. And then she said, well, the Apostle Paul spread all kinds of propaganda. <laughs> I said, this isn't Paul. This is Jesus who preached about hell. Well, who wrote down the words of Jesus? Well, I said, the apostles and their associates. Well, see? <laughs> and the problem with this woman, she had a sieve. And if the Bible agreed with her opinions, she kept it. But if the Bible disagreed with her, out goes the Bible. First person hears the word of God, but the devil gobbles it up so they don't believe it. Look at verse, uh, person number two now is in verse 16. And in a similar way, these are the ones on whom the seed was sown on the rocky soil, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no firm root in themselves, but only are temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. Person number two joyfully receives the word of God, but falls away under persecution. In the... 1500s, John Knox founded the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. They were persecuted because they weren't the official church. And one of, one of uh, John Knox's uh, relatives, they arrested her husband for following the Presbyterian faith. And the police came and knocked on Jane Welsh, that's his wife's door, and said, Mrs. Welsh, if you could just convince your husband to turn away from Presbyterianism, we'll let him out of prison. <laughs> and Jane Welsh held up the two corners of her apron. I would sooner catch my husband's head in this apron than that he should deny our evangelical faith. <laughs> she stood firm in the face of persecution, but 
the person number two doesn't. They, they fall away. I, I mean, I remember years ago, uh, it was probably about 18, 19 year old came into my office and yeah, my dad asked me to come visit and I'm in real trouble with the law and I may be doing jail time. And he was really scared. And he, his dad wanted me to share the gospel with him. So I did. And I explained Christ and salvation and you need to accept Christ and repent of your sin. Yeah, I do. I really do. And before I prayed and, and, and had of him accept Christ, I said, now you need to know something though. This is for life. If you accept Christ, this is for the rest of your life you're going to follow him. And he said, okay. And we prayed and he accepted Christ. And he was in church a few Sundays and then I never saw him again. And the dad said, yeah, the second the heat was off and they withdrew the law lawsuit and such, he went right back to his old friends. That, that is because person number two believes for a little while, but they don't have roots. Uh, you know, I, I remember looking out my window once, straight line winds were going through my neighborhood and I saw these big trees go boom to the ground. I ran into the basement. After the storm, I walked the neighborhood. It looked like a war zone. All these trees just flat. <clears throat> there were trees though that stood and those were the trees that have deep roots. So I wanna encourage you, don't be person number two. Get deep roots, read your Bible regularly, go to church every week, pray regularly, have good Christian friends, because you don't wanna be person number two that falls over. Next is person number three, look at verse 18. And others are the ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word of God and three thorns, the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Person number three is unfruitful because of cares, riches and desires. Let's, let's look at each of those thorns. First, cares or worry. There's a saying, worry is like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. <laughs> there are people who are so worried, they can't even think about serving God. That's the first thorn. The second thorn is riches. And notice in verse 19, Jesus talks about the deceitfulness of riches because riches tempt us to trust them rather than him. There's a story back in the mid 1800s that a preacher accompanied the miners out to California for the gold rush because he wanted to preach the gospel to them and he did. But when he got to California, he wanted to see what it was like. So he started panning for gold and he caught the gold fever and he stopped preaching and he panned for gold. Finally, he had a, in his kerchief a, a big uh, bag of gold dust. But the story goes, finally, he went to the top of a mountain, undid the kerchief and flicked the gold dust to the winds. <laughs> I think riches are a big thorn for American Christians. So worry can choke out the word. Riches can choke out the word. The third thorn in uh, verse 19 is the thorn of the desires for other things. I, I know a missionary who many years was in Germany preaching the gospel. And he says to me, you know, many, many years ago, the people in Germany went to church but now almost nobody goes to church. And I said, yeah, why is that? And he said, they would never dream of interrupt, interrupting their holiday. They call the weekend their holiday and they go traveling and they do all kinds of fun things. And the reason they don't go to church is that's their holiday. <laughs> that's called the desire for other things. I mean, I, there was a man in Minneapolis, Christian man, I think, I thought, uh, let a Bible study. He left his wife for another woman. That's called the desire for other things. Are you letting worry or riches or the desire for other things destroy your Christian life? 
Look at verse 20 for the fourth person. And these are the ones on whom the seed was sown on the good ground. And they, bear, they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30, 60, and a hundredfold. The fourth person hears the word of God, accepts it, and bears fruit. So here's the big question from this parable. Are you bearing fruit by the way you live your life? by the way you talk, by the way you spend your money, are you bearing fruit for the kingdom? You know, I'll tell you, if all you care about is your own salvation, that you go to heaven, and you don't care if other people go to heaven, I think that's a sign that you're probably not going to heaven. (laughs) Because a true Christian just doesn't want it for himself. You bear fruit. Now, we don't do that perfectly, but that's the goal of our lives. So let, let's end this sermon now by asking the question. And I, I ask you to do some self-examination. Which of these four people are you? Number one, do you hear the word of God, but the devil gobbles it up so you don't believe it? Or are you person number two, do you hear and accept the word of God, but when it gets tough, you give up? Or are you person number three, you hear the word of God, but your desire for worry or money or other things choke it out, Or are you person number four? Are you bearing fruit for God? Are you doing things to bring people to the Lord and using your life for God's glory? You know, a a song that's been going through my head the last couple of days, it's an old Negro spiritual, and it goes like this. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready, Lord, ready to put on my long white robe. The way we are ready (laughs) is by bearing fruit for the kingdom. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor's study where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. Pastor Brock, our first question today, did Jesus privately explain all the parables to the disciples? No, there are some, like I'll give you an example, the parable of the mustard seed. Jesus said, now the mustard seed is the smallest of the seeds, but when it grows, it becomes this huge plant and the birds of the air take shelter in it. He never explained what that meant. Mm -hmm. And, And I remember when I took a Bible class at college, the professor had everybody take a piece of paper and write down what they thought the meaning of the parable of the mustard seed was. Mm-hmm. And some people said, well, the seed is your faith and it just grows and grows. And some, some people said, well, no, the seed is when you give money and it just to the Lord and it grows and grows. They had all these different interpretations. And I think the professor was making the point, we need to study we need the commentaries. Mm-hmm. And, and most scholars think it means that the seed is the church. When Jesus was on earth, the church was tiny, mm-hmm. but it was going to become huge. Mm-hmm. And so that's probably what the parable, but that's one of the few parables Jesus did not explain. Mm-hmm. But again, I, I encourage people to get the ESV study Bible where you can look at that and say, well, okay, well, what? What have Christians understood that to mean for 2,000 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Helps. Helps the person understand. Is there a Bible storybook for children you recommend? You know, if, again, this is the old, when I was little, we had this one with lots of pictures. And you can go to uh, online and just, just Google in Bible comic book. Mm-hmm. I loved comic books as a, as a kid. Mm-hmm. And you can buy a, a, a Bible now that's the Bible stories all in comic book form because kids are visual. And I would have loved that. I, w- I would be a scholar at age 10 mm-hmm. had I had a comic book Bible. So that's one. But there's lots of good storybooks, Christian storybooks, uh, Bible storybooks. Just Google it or look online for children's Bible storybook, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Here's a letter from a viewer. I believe God knows the future, but he doesn't cause or predestine people because he respects our free will. Your thoughts? 
Does the Bible teach free will? That you on your own power can come to Christ and believe in him? I don't think it does. Uh, like I, sh I said in this sermon just now, uh, Paul says, Timothy, be gentle with your opponents. God may perhaps th grant them repentance. And it says in the book of Acts, the Lord opened Lydia's heart mm -hmm. to receive the things said by Paul. Mm -hmm. So the belief in free will is very popular among Christians that it's up to you whether you're saved or not. I don't think we have free will. We lost that in the Garden of Eden. And ever since Adam and Eve sinned, we are bound to sin. And so I, uh, uh, Erasmus in the 1500s wrote a book called The Freedom of the Will. Mm -hmm. And Luther hated that book and wrote a response called The Bondage of the Will, mm -hmm. that we're not free to come to God on our own power. But to quote Luther, I, I believe in the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength come to my Lord Jesus Christ or believe in him, but the Holy Spirit does that. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Can we pray for someone's heart to be opened? Yes. I mean, that's, uh, you know, uh, people don't like the, the doctrine of predestination, which I believe in. But Mona, when we pray, mm -hmm. we're all predestinarians. Because when you pray, you pray, Lord, pr please make Uncle Joe a Christian. Because mm -hmm. somewhere deep down, you know, Uncle Joe can't do that on his own. God needs to step in. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. If people fall away from Christ, do they ever come back? Can you think of somebody that did in the New Testament? that fell away and came Peter? back. Peter? Yeah, Peter. He fell away for a moment mm -hmm. and then came back. So it can happen if, if somebody's watching this show and you've left the Lord, uh, you need to come back to him. Because listen to these sobering verses. I'm just, th these are hard verses to understand. I'm not sure I understand them. Mm -hmm. But listen to this from Hebrews chapter four, verse six. Verse four. In the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So if, if you're watching this, and you've left Christ, you need to come back and pray for the Holy Spirit to help you come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Mona, we've got only about 30 seconds left, and just everybody, we want to encourage you to go to pastorstudy.org, and you can watch all of our TV shows there. If the Lord uh, nudges you to support our ministry and to help us stay on the air, you'd go there as well. And just uh, great having you with us. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. See you next week. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because of the generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.